Hey guys, it's Uncle Doug coming to you from the basement of one of the ministry houses here in uh, Liberty, Missouri. The last ministry house. And if you notice, there might be uh, some stuff missing behind me. Uh, we're packing it down and getting ready to move. I, um, I hope in the next week, maybe two at the most, but by the end of the month, we'll be out of here. And um, on to the next phase of this adventure. Uh, if you've been following from the beginning, the very first videos were recorded at a Pay by the Week hotel, which uh, has changed names three times now, I think, or two times. And um, uh, here in Liberty, where we were, I stayed before we got the first of the townhouses. And then the videos transitioned from one to another to another to another as we moved around in different uh, townhouses. Um, anyway, um, that season's coming to an end as we're getting ready to move into the new ministry houses out uh, in Excelsior Springs near nearer to the farm. And we'll talk about that more some as time goes on here. Um, but we're excited about that and what God's doing there. Um, I've got a video I'd like you to watch. And um, the video is about how good God can take care of you. Even when you're not one of his. Even when you don't know it's him. Even when you may not give him the glory for it. Um, this is the story I found on the internet of a young man who uh, was nearly killed as a gang initiation for a kid he grew up with that was wanting to join a gang, lured him into a bad neighborhood and shot him three times. And um, I want you to watch and see if you can tell where God sent angels uh, in this uh, in this mix to keep him alive now what the Lord has for this young man I don't know <laughs> but to me it's another example that uh, if uh, somebody wants to hurt you and today's not your day there's really nothing they can do to speed along and when it is your day to go home and to, to die there's nothing anybody can do to stop it. But um, this young man clearly has uh, more to do in his life, and uh, the Lord wanted to keep him around a while, and there's just a beautiful set of miracles um, that I don't think he maybe even uh, uh, gives God the full glory for. Not the least in the story is the PTSD that he suffered because of it and how one day it was just gone just gone and he chose to rejoice um, so there were certainly people praying for him and maybe God heard their prayers um, but um, it's a beautiful testament uh, I'm not going to come back on at the end and explain it to you because I think you're smart enough to figure it out and be blessed by it without commentary from me but um, uh, anyway so I'll just end here uh, thanks for uh, watching the videos and your support we appreciate all the prayer we can get and if you'd like to help financially you can donate to uh, FOTM at fellowshipofthemartyrs.com by PayPal or you can go to the website which is fellowshipofthemartyrs.com click on the piggy bank and uh, you can give through there um, uh, there's also an address there if you want to mail a check or whatever so uh, we could sure sure use the help right now we're hard pressed on every side right now so uh, but this is uh, a reminder to me, and I hope a reminder to you, of uh, how good God is and how much he can take care of you and how the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous because he loves us all and, and uh, we're his creation and he wants to do good to us. Um, anyway, 
Uh, enjoy the video. Uh, that's all for now. God bless you all. Amen. My name is Ross Capicchioni. I'm from Macomb, Michigan, a suburb outside of Detroit. Start with your story of you know, how it happened. Yeah. Well, it, all, it happened like I was a junior in high school, you know, 17 year old punk shit. Just doing my thing, skating, hanging out. What I mean is basically there's no this kid, supposedly, was supposed to be my friend, and I knew this kid for uh, 10 years prior before this day. He asked me, hey, can you give me a ride to my cousin's house, you know, down in the D? All right, yeah, well, like, what part? Like, the west side or the east side? And he's like, the east side. And I was like, nah, man, I don't got no business on the east side, you know? He's like, no, nah, it's cool, man. Like, the east side, that's like seven mile, like, it's just, it's like a third world country. The police, they won't stop and get out the car. They won't pull you over. If there's gunshots, they'll wait till everything's clear and they'll come pick your body up off the street and that's it. He's like, please, man, please. I'm like, no. So, like, a week goes by, you know, I'm still telling him no, like, because I had a feeling, like, don't go down there. Kept asking me, I'll give you 30 bucks for gas, all this shit. I'm like, all right, whatever, you know, you're my friend. I'll take you down there. I go to school that day, and I get out, and everything seems normal. We go to the gas station, he gives me the money for gas. We drive down there. So I get off, and it's just like, I get that eerie feeling, like you're in a bad spot. When it's like broad daylight out, beautiful day like the, today. And we're driving, and he's telling me where to go, and we pull out in the street, and you know, there's people outside, and he's like, all right, that's the house right there. So he's like, you know, pull around back in the back. Like when I turned the corner to go right, like I seen it, it was like a caution by do not enter and all this shit, but I still, you know, because I, I knew him for so long, I just thought, you know, it's the D, it's, you know, whatever. There was a fence, like a grass area, my, my vehicle, and then houses right there. So it was like, nah, I wasn't in the middle of nowhere or anything. And like I get out, and he gets out, and like, it's only a couple seconds. I'm looking around. And my ears are ringing. I'm like, man, that was close. And I kind of just glance down, and my arms just hanging off, just hanging off like a zombie. And I'm just looking at it. And I'm like, yeah, this is you know, that's not real. And I kind of shake it off and look again, and it's just hanging off my arm. And I'm like, okay. Then it kicks in, like blood, like flowing, like like an animal and then I look up and this kid's just holding a shotgun like 10 feet away from me just holding it right at me and I asked him I said like did you shoot me and he just <laughs> blew a hole in my chest like this big so after that I just dropped to my knees I lost all my air I couldn't see I remember like being on my like you know on my hands and knees and I felt the barrel of the gun on my head I felt this barrel just shaking stuff in my head, and so I smacked it away. But it was a shotgun, so it sprayed. So it still like hit me in the head really good, but it didn't blow my head off like a watermelon, just to pieces. So after that, I got a little sight, and I was like, okay, I'm still moving. Like, I don't know what's going on with my head, but I know I'm alive. And I remember I looked up, and he was just staring at me, and he took the butt of the gun and like smashed me in the face with it. Knocks my teeth out. Like I fall back, but I can still see at this point, and I don't understand like how I can see because I have so much damage to like my lung and heart. I felt like these hands like in my pocket digging for my car keys. Like, when he's trying to grab my keys, like I ended up on my stomach. And I look up and I see my Jeep commander driving away, just driving away, flying away. And I said, okay, well, either I stay laid down in this spot right here and die, or I try to get up. So I try to push myself up, but like take my left arm take it right out so gunshot to the chest bigger than a soup bowl and then my head all mashed up and I'm trying to push myself off the ground I kept trying and trying and I'm like all right you know what one more I'm gonna try it one more time and I pushed up and then I out of nowhere I felt these arms from underneath me pick me up and I remember like swinging trying to grab someone and there was no one around and I was just like standing up still like a like you know like a drunk like you know zombie just like and I got this like, like a shove, like someone shoved me from behind to go forward. I must have got about seven, eight feet. I just fell straight down. Cause I remember I hit the ground like on my stomach. I'm like, all right, well I went as far as I could. This shit's hurting like too much. Like let me just close my eyes and start relaxing. Sure enough, I closed my eyes and all the pain started going away. And then I'd wake up real fast and be like, this is not right. I just got shot 30 seconds ago. How's the pain stopping? 
And I'm like, yeah, don't worry about it. You know, go back to sleep. That's a good feeling when you're sleeping. So I'll pass back out a little bit, and then I'd be, I'd be di like dying. And then I'd wake myself up, uh, like my own voice, third person. And, hey, man, get up, man, you're dying. And then like, I did that, and then I heard, hey, hey. And I like started hearing this guy, and he's like running over to me. So when I fell, there was a, like a probation officer at a stoplight, and he seen me fall out of the woods, like all bloody broad daylight. And then I felt his hand on my back, like, hey, man, you're fine. Don't, don't, don't close your eyes. You know, come on, the ambulance is coming, they're coming. And I'm like, man, like, I just want to sleep. Leave me alone, man. But then in my head, I'm like, no, you don't, because if you fall asleep, you're sleeping forever. And I remember, like, getting on the stretcher, and they're putting me in the stretcher, and just, like, the, the facial expression of the paramedic was just like, just a stunned look on his face, but in the same time telling me I looked great. I looked beautiful, like you're gonna be fine. And then it just like blacked out and I went to like a, like I was outside of the ambulance on my skateboard, filming it, like rolling telephoto filming of the ambulance and the doors open, everyone's panicking and I see my legs coming out and like once it gets to my head, blacked out. I was pronounced dead on arrival right there. John Doe had nothing on me. They said, you know, doc, this, this kid's, you know, gone and doc said no. Ah, I, you know, I'm here, let me try, let me try. Like when I was pronounced dead on arrival, like throw him in the body bag, he's dead. Like the doctor said, no, like, you know, I'm gonna try to help him. This man doesn't know who I am. He could have said, yeah, he's dead, all right, I'm going back home. He said, no, like I feel something, I, I'm gonna try. Did the heart surgery, gave me 24 hours to you know, see if I was still breathing on the ventilator. After 24 hours, I was still alive. They fixed my arm and my head, and I woke up three days later. I remember like waking up, and it was still all white, like white everywhere, and I'm like, I'm dead, I'm dead. I'm 17, I'm dead. And then it starts to like come in, and it's like I see curtains, like a, like a freaking oxygen tank, and I'm like, like starting, then out of nowhere, bam, perfect vision again, I'm in a hospital, and I'm, then I'm like tied down to the bed because I got the breathing tube in me. I got this thing pumping air into my lungs, so I start freaking out. But there was a nurse there the whole time though, I didn't even notice her because I was all tied down, and I just hear screaming like, he's awake, he's awake! And I see her like running out of the room, and then like running back, like three more nurses and the doctor, just this woman just coming around the corner flying, like throws her clipboard in the air, runs up to me, oh my God, you look beautiful. Like, and in my head, I'm like, what do you mean? I look beautiful, I can't even, what's, what's going on? Like, am I tied down? And then she's like, all right, one, two. And like on two, she pulled that thing out of my throat, man. I got like, I got to breathe again, like real air, like, ah. and, you know, of course I coughed up a ball of tar and BBs, but everyone was just looking at me like, you're, you're alive. Like you're, you're breathing on your own right now. Like, what's your name? I don't know. What year is it? What? Who's the president? Huh? Is there any way we could contact anyone you know with a phone number? I was like, two, seven. Out of anything, my name, anything, the year, only thing I remembered after that was my father's phone number. For three days, my family didn't know. My father was outside, like, spraying out the garage, and he got the phone call from the hospital saying, I think we got your son, he's been shot, but he's alive. So, I don't know how my parents had to, I don't know how that feels, like you're a father. Like, so, I don't know, it chokes me up, cause like, it's crazy, but they came down there and I remember like I seen my mom come in and my dad and I'm looking at him, I was like, mom, you can't get mad at me right now. She's like, mad, you're alive, you're alive. After like the fourth day, they were like, all right, get up, you know, start walking, like, let's go. I'm like, let's go where? He's like, you're going home tomorrow. I'm like, it's been five days. He's like, dude, you're going home. What do you want to live in a hospital? You want to go live your life again? I'm like, sir, I got a hole in my chest the size of a teacup. He's like, listen, Ross, I gave you a tip of advice. You live through this, you're going to be okay. Just go home, live your life. Don't hang out with these kids anymore. And after five days, they sent me home. So like, I, I'm shy, you know? My parents are asking me questions. My dad's asking me, what are we gonna do about it? 
And I'm like telling him, like, Dad, I know who did it, you know? The next day, like, out of a movie, like, these men in suits came in. And my dad's like, yeah, can I help you? And they pull out their, you know, badges and FBI, you know. They say the kid's name. And I'm like, yeah, I know him. That's who shot me. He's like, oh, could you identify him through a picture? I was like, of course. Pull out a picture of the kid. I said, that's him right there. He said, Ross, we have him in custody. I said, how? I just woke up like two days ago. I just learned how my name again, like how to talk. He's like, the day Blank shot you, he called Blank and told him. So this kid shoots me and calls his buddy and says, hey, I shot Ross, he's dead. The kid's like, no, you didn't, you're lying. Because imagine another 15-year-old kid saying to a 15-year-old kid, you know? So after they hang up, the kid he told calls the police on him. And he was met by the SWAT team right at his front yard. Got him. And like, all I had to do was go to court and testify against him. I went in there, man, in a wheelchair, head still stapled, no teeth, 105 pounds because of all the blood I lost, arm cast, and I sat in front of 40 of his family and him, and he couldn't look me in the eye. He had his head down the whole time, and I had to tell my story like this to everyone. That was the first one. I had to go back to final sentencing and that's when I was healed like so I I walked back in the courtroom the second time he comes out in a purple suit top hat cane and sunglasses this is the kid who shot me at court smiling while his family cheers him on says like way to shoot Ross called me a coward because I, I was taking the justice route like I didn't lower myself to his standards and go try to kill him I spoke and the judge like looked at this kid and said you know said his name and he said Yo, Ross, thank you. And the kid just looked at the judge like, what do you mean? He's like, because if you would have killed Ross that day, you would have got life in prison. But since Ross is a warrior and survived, you get a second chance, and he just slammed the gavel on him. He said, go have fun in prison for 35 years. Well, I found out that the cause of the shooting was because he had to join a gang. That was his, his, his initiation was kill a random person. He had to pick someone, so he just thought I would be the guy to pick. Yeah, that happened in 2007, been about four years. And I'm telling you, the first two were the hardest. Like, it's hard, like, like, waking up and knowing, like, someone tried to, like, shoot you down. You got to get through that every day, like, seeing people. Like, I, I get on a bus, public bus, I'm freaking out the whole time. Like, I don't trust anyone on the bus. For a while, my mother had to like take care of me as like like how you do an infant, like washing, changing, feeding. Like I'm 17 years old and I, I got my mom bathing me. I can't move. I got no hand. I can't talk. I'm all weak. And my you know my dad and mom were like Ross, like come on, like the doctors say, like give it time. And then all my friends like coming to see me, hanging out with me. I started getting more positive. One day I woke up and I just I felt different, like. I was like, you know what, this is, this is my world. That's what I, like every time in physical therapy, like I would try to do something, mess up, I'd be like, well, it's like a nolly backside flip. Like, you're gonna mess up and, until you try it and land it. When I'd mess up, I'd be like, nolly backside flip, and then I'd, I'd get it. Like, I'd do something with my hand and like put the thing in, and the doctor would be like, oh yeah, good job, like you did it. And I'd be like, hmm. So I like started living my life as like skateboarding. It's been working. I'm very blessed, like, like, like I, I, I see it now, like when before I'm like, you know what, like I'm so unlucky, like I, got, I went through all this sh getting shot and really like I look at it now after like maturing and growing up, like it just gave me a, like a whole new leg up on life and how I can live my life and it's crazy, like it's, amazing. it's like makes me happy to be alive and it's like so grateful for everything. Like I just look at what I got, I don't look at what I don't have, I look at what I have.